Hello to our Pleasant Green parishioners and our listeners as well. This is Minister Leonard Harris, and this is our lesson number seven from Unit 2 out of our Faith Pathway Study Manual for Adults. Uh, this is for April the 12th, 2020. And our Unit Two of study for this spring quarter is God promises a just kingdom. And uh, the title for our lesson number seven is Hope for a Better Life. And our devotional reading is from the book of Isaiah, the 53rd chapter verses 4 through 12, and our background scripture is Mark, the 16th chapter, and also 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. And our printed passage is 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 8, Also, 12 through 14, 20 through 23, and 42 through 45. And our key verse is 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 19 through 20. And it reads... If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. For Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Our lessons aims for this Sunday are contrast the love of the women which the disciples response to their actions. And that uh, in parenthesis is Mark the 16th chapter 1 through 9, our background scripture. Uh, For those that would like to read on the actions of the women uh, with their demonstration of love to Christ uh, with the disciples response to their actions, And then appreciate the woman's preparation of Jesus for his coming death and burial. Again, background scripture, Mark 16, verses 1 through 9. And then embrace the call to proclaim the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, despite the ridicule or resistance. Our lesson is divided into three different sections, and the first is entitled, It's a Fact, and this will cover verses 1 through 8 in the 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Our second section is the necessity of the resurrection And these uh, verses cover 12 through 14 and 20 through 23. And then our last section is entitled, The Character of the Resurrection. And these verses cover 42 through 45. And also, uh, as a reminder, uh, we... Note that at the beginning of our lesson, a part of our background uh, scripture is the whole chapter of the uh, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, is a part of our uh, background reading. Uh, Before we indulge ourselves into our lesson, uh, we would like to send uh, our heartfelt Uh, condolences and prayers out to all of those, not just in our listening audience, but around the world, 
that are encountering grieving moments uh, for the departure of loved ones and that are also encountering or being combated by the care of loved ones who may have encountered the coronavirus and we realize that this is a unprecedented moment uh, throughout the world um, and uh, in our time and we know it has caught many of us uh, unaware and unprepared and uh, we pray that the peace and comfort of God which surpasses all understanding will rest, rule, and abide with everyone who is under the sound of our voice. And we ask God to be the increased and to fulfill our impatience, our shortness, our weaknesses, and to just uh, increase and be the plus uh, in our lives when we are encountering minuses. With the current crisis of COVID-19, our lesson is even more so appropriate because it speaks of hope for a better life. It speaks for uh, humankind to witness, to encounter to actually be the recipients of a life of justice, a life of love, a life of compassion, uh, a life of Christ. And our, lex our lesson uh, begins, our first uh, section uh, begins by affirming that Christ did die that Christ was buried, that Christ was risen from the grave, and it is identified or worded as it's a fact. And when we look at this, it would be to our benefit if we would also uh, look at some of the, uh, we will say it's a precursor, uh, a forward uh, to understanding why this topic and the focus of this lesson, uh, why it was even necessary or required uh, for it to be discussed. Uh, during uh, the time when Paul was presenting this to the Church of Corinth or to the Corinthians, um, we would have to do a little background reading um, if we began in uh, the fourth chapter of the book of Acts and then also uh, the 17th chapter of the book of Acts uh, beginning at about the 18th verse. And if we would read forward, we would recognize that the uh, Greeks or the Athenians from Athens, uh, there was another teaching going out through the land. Uh, and this teaching was is that uh, there was no resurrection for the soul of man. Uh, there, the Athenians, the Greeks, the philosophers, and other rulers, uh, they were preaching against resurrection of the body and uh, first of all they were not uh, informed totally of this teaching and we would be able to get a snapshot of this uh, by reading uh, the Acts the fourth chapter uh, and then the 17th chapter of Acts and it would give us more of an insight into what Paul was actually dealing with when we come into the book of Corinthians. And <clears throat> we would see, uh, as Paul 
addresses this when he breaks forth the facts, um, which was a practice among the uh, practitioners of Judaism that whenever there was a dispute or whenever there was an issue among the two individuals, it was required to have witnesses, two or three witnesses, to be as overseers or to be observers of the incident so that there would be those who could forward testimony as to how this dispute was handled or how it was addressed. And so having witnesses to verify something was a practice among uh, the believers in, in Judaism of that time. And so Paul, understanding and knowing that this was uh, a part of the practice of law proceedings, then Paul addressed the issue of the resurrection of Christ by verifying it by witnesses. Because this, again, was a part of the practice of law at that time. And so how Paul addressed it, the way that he identified it is through our verses 1 through 8, and he first identifies to them and reminds them that he had preached the gospel to them and that they had received it and they had taken a stand upon it. And he said that not only did was this preached to you and you received it and took a stand, but because of that, by this gospel that was preached to you, you are now saved. And if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise, now notice that he said, by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. The validation then is on the fact that Christ did die and according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas or Peter and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. And we know Paul here is speaking of his encounter on the road to Damascus. And so Paul brings forth the evidence because whether they were believers or not, or if they were wavering in their belief, here at least he brought forth evidence to uh, verify what they were troubled with or what they were wavering with because of other teaching. And we must uh, reflect and, and realize also that this uh, other form of teaching was coming from positions that uh, were authoritative positions at that time. Uh, the Athenians or the Grecians would have assemblies. Uh, there would be a like a town hall meeting. Uh, there were uh, uh, assemblies that would take place uh, outside where people would gather. And the Grecians who were in a form of Gnosticism, uh, 
And Gnosticism translated just means to know. It is of the practice of knowledge. Well, they would assemble themselves and debate uh, back and forth. And one would try to uh, overwhelm another position or another opinion with debates. And he who would bring forth more knowledge about a particular subject would win the argument. And uh, we will, uh, you can get a uh, background of that in the 17th chapter of Acts. Uh, here is where they were uh, alarmed because they had not heard of this doctrine of the resurrection of the body of those that had fallen asleep and died who would be resurrected because Christ was resurrected from the dead. And we will address that further into our lesson. Now, one of the things that I feel is uh, significant for us in this day and time uh, to reflect upon Because those who have been on this journey uh, for some time uh, understand these words and these scriptures and possibly have read them and memorized them and know them to heart. Um, But others who may be new in the faith and new along this journey are not as well versed and don't understand as well. Uh, Another perspective on this is, is first of all, uh, we have to recognize that we serve a God which is self-created and a God of creation. God of creation. And our God is a spirit not a physical uh, man, as many times it is mistakenly and falsely uh, perceived or assumed. A lot of times through artwork and such, we have this uh, image of a God as a gray-haired man sitting on a throne somewhere up in the heavens. But God is a spirit. And when we look at the way God expresses God's power and capability, we happen to be in a season which addresses our topic, resurrection. Because We are now in spring, and so much is connected to the very purpose of us celebrating the resurrection of Christ at this time is because in God's creation, all that God created in nature is under the same resurrection. It is being renewed It is being redeemed. It is being brought back from what appeared to be dead and barren is now being renewed and resurrected to life. And when we look at this, we have to recognize that God is the God of life, the God of renewing, the God of resurrecting that which appeared to be dead. In fact, what led us into the celebration of the Resurrection Sunday is what referred to in Scripture is the Passover. And the Passover is the sun crossing the equatorial orbit or circle. And when the sun crosses the equator, usually around March the 21st or 25th, 
it passes from below the equator coming from the winter season or referred to as the winter solstice and it now is crossing the equator and now the days become longer and life is reborn and so we call it the pass over but what we must recognize is is that whether or not we acknowledge that God is the God of creation, the God of renewing, the God of restoring, the God of resurrecting that which appeared to be dead and then bring it back to life, whether we acknowledge it or not, the sun will still pass over from the winter solstice into the spring equinox and life will be reborn. Now, if God does that in God's creation and God uses this as an expression of God's power and God's ability, it is we would say the attribute of God, then we have to recognize that God is the God of resurrection. It is a part of God's expression as to what the Spirit of God is able to do. Now, <clears throat> we also want to look at the next uh, session or uh, next section of our lesson. This uh, brings us into some things that uh, should directly be related to us. <clears throat> and this talks about the necessity of the resurrection. Uh, when we look at these verses, uh, we really should uh, draw attention sometimes as to um, how this relates to us as individuals and then also group. How does this relate to us collectively as a whole? But listen to what Paul is saying. He says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, first, he bears witness of those who actually saw Christ. Then, now he begins to propose questions to us and says that, now, if Christ has been preached that he was raised to, from the dead, then how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Other than someone has placed that thought, there has been a foreign teaching that has now said that uh, this is not possible. Then he goes on and he says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Now, these things come because uh, there is a wavering. The wavering is caused by those who are either uninformed or those who choose based upon a certain teaching or doctrine uh, that they want to prevail above that, which is unexplainable from their point of view. Now it goes on and Chris says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came, through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But in, in each turn, so according to each person's own individual re resurrection, it says, but in turn Christ, the first fruits, then, when he comes, those who belong to him will follow. Now, when we when we think of this here, 
and we look in at the 15th chapter of uh, 1 Corinthians, a lot of times, uh, a lot of focus uh, in uh, church assemblies uh, has been addressed and identified to uh, recognizing what Adam did. And so many times we speak about uh, Adam and Adam's fall and, and Adam's disobedience and how that affected the whole world. And man is a fallen individual because of the fall of Adam. Uh, so much has been attributed to Adam. Uh, all of our wayward ways and, and all of our failures and, and all of our sin-filled lives has been attributed to Adam. Uh, so much so that uh, sometimes we even say, well, you know, Adam, you know, the father of mankind, you know, it, it was Adam's fault. Uh, but scripture also tells us that Adam was born of the natural. That is, we read further into the first Corinthians, the 15th chapter, the, the 46th verse. And it talks about that. Now in 45, it speaks of that Adam became a living soul. The first man, Adam, became a living soul, but the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And then it talks about the spiritual was not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth made of dust, but the second man is the Lord from heaven. So it makes a distinction here between the natural man and the spiritual man. And when we look at this, so much attention is directed towards the first man when in truth we are spiritual beings and we are encountering a human experience, but we are spiritual beings. Um, and when we look at that value, then our focus should be upon spiritual things. So therefore, we should be looking to the second Adam, the second Adam, who is the life-giving spirit. Now, the other issue about this is that it said that Christ was the first fruits. And again, we talk about uh, a lot of times Christ uses agrarian focuses, things that are of agricultural nature, because these during this time, the agricultural practices and customs and um, daily functions were very key to the people during that time. And so it was easily understood. Now, when they would go out for the early harvest, uh, they would pluck some of the produce from what had been planted, and it would be then viewed, and it, they would look at the early produce from what was planted. And here, that would give a indication of what was following. So when they speak here of Christ and address Christ here as the first fruits, it speaks of the early harvest and it talks about how then the wording of the scripture uses it to identify then if Christ is the first fruits of those that were dead but yet were raised, then Christ is the beginning but not the ending. Therefore, others are coming after Christ because Christ is the first 
fruits of the harvest. But Christ is not the end of the harvest. That there will be other fruits, other produce, the other results that come after the resurrection of Christ, the first of the fruits. So when we look at wording and recognize the process here, now <clears throat> our ending uh, section talks about the character of the resurrection. And I like how the commentary uh, breaks this down uh, into uh, it addresses the uh, conflict or it, it addresses the combative uh, argument uh, from the Athenians and Greek philosophers uh, teaching. <clears throat> and here it addresses their concern that the body, it was viewed that the body was sinful and that the body uh, being contaminated and being perishable uh, and being sinful could not be raised from the dead. Well, Paul addresses that in this light. And he says, so, this is the 42nd verse, and he says, so it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in perishable. It is raised imperishable. Now, the I'm reading it NIV, but the King James uh, says it is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It says it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam is a life-giving spirit. And the commentary uh, summarizes it in this light and it says first the resurrection body will be imperishable and will not be subject to decay then second it will be one of glory that is free of the sin or the stain of sin and thirdly, the resurrection body will not be characterized by human frailty, but by power. Now, when we uh, look at this uh, comparison, uh, we look at how uh, one form, we are created in one form, but then scripture also tells us that flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. We can't enter in in this form, but we will be changed and our current and physical presence will be transformed into a heavenly presence, into a spiritual form. And so therefore, when we address it and look at it in that light. Now, I want us to uh, read in closing, I want to read this passage of scripture uh, to add to the closing verses of the character of the resurrection. Now, in 2 Corinthians, and this would be in the fourth chapter. Uh, these scriptures will be familiar, but yet still affirming. And uh, we'll start at the 16th verse. But 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, beginning at the 16th and entering into the fifth chapter. Therefore, we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing, 
yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And many times in worship, we always say that this earth is not my home, that I'm just passing through, that heaven is my home. So the beginning of the fifth chapter says, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent, this physical domain that we're occupying for the moment, but if it is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We hope that something was said in this lesson that reaffirmed the foundation of our faith and what we stand upon. And as always, we pray the blessings of God, especially during this time of trial, and we pray, pray the peace and the comfort of God to be upon all of those under the sound of our voice. And we always ask it in the name of Christ and for his sake. Amen.